So this was your homework that was due. And I just wanted to uh, see what you guys thought after you had time to noodle kind of problems that you face. How did you do putting them into this box? So did you find that uh, all right to do? How that, what they were like? Like what sort of problems did you face that were kind of open-ended or opportunities? Sometimes this can be a little nebulous as we um, work through it. So let me just do a quick little thing here with uh, open-ended problems versus closed-end problems, the nature of the problem. And then formulaic, maintenance, predicament, opportunities. So of your problems in life, which ones did you find up in this category? Let's call it the, the predicament one where they're kind of a little more complex and maybe need some creative thinking to them. An example of one of those. Add one down. Yeah, Ricardo. A lot of what? Predicament problems. Okay. Oh yeah, exactly. I think the leaving the country is a big one, right? That's a perfect example of that. And so, um, you know, leaving the country is kind of an interesting one because you probably ran into some predicaments that you were reacting to, but at the same time, there's probably opportunities that you've been, you've made some decisions that you were being more proactive, like I'm going to do this so that hopefully this goes better uh, when I get here. Yeah, that's a great one. Okay. Any other last comments? Okay, great. Any other ones? Somebody wants to share. Yeah, Bryce. Like, um, some of mine, I thought, like, fell in, like, multiple categories. Like, one of them was, like, what I had, like, one piece. So, like, sometimes it's just reactive, like, whatever, um, like, it, like, sounds good. And other times it's proactive, like, if I don't have, like, a game that day, I probably don't need to be doing yeah, it. That's a, yeah, that's a really good, good example. Yeah. So, back when I actually used to run. <laughs> Sally's been needing more running, apparently. Um, but I used to do kind of same thing, like before a, a race, a 5K or 10K, or I did a couple different half, half marathons. Um, but you really think about what you're eating the day before, if it's the salmon or you know other stuff that's going to be good to give you enough energy before. So yeah, that's a cool example. OK, anybody else? All right, well, it's helpful in, in our context because the stuff that we're going to learn is really not this. And so a lot of these categories are falling more in the management uh, category. And so this class is trying to handle the unknown and the open-ended problems uh, more. So he's calling this creative management when we're reactive because a leader is really looking forward. And so that's why the leadership stuff tends to fall in this, in this category. And of course, as we saw with a lot of the quotes, leadership and management, there's, there's a big overlap too, right? So you can kind of have your manager cap on, even if you're a great leader, you know, you have to dabble in a little bit of areas, but it's helpful to identify where this creativity component is going to be is it's really going to live up here. Um, so uh, when we think about the activities of a person who owns a business or something, when they have their leadership uh, hat on, we're looking for things that are more complex. And so some of the problems in life, like what we're going to eat uh, maybe today because we're hungry or something, is not going to need the things that you're going to learn in this book is kind of the point. So some of the things that we're going to do in the activities and uh, yeah, the almost experiments and uh, activities are going to be related to uh, being creative at finding those problems. Okay, so today whoops, we're going to introduce the thing, which I kind of showed you a little bit yesterday. So this is really how 
uh, entering chapter three of this book is where we're going. So remember, there's an eight-week course. We got all spring break, so I kind of wanted to get uh, a little bit into the front. So after spring break, um, you know, be through chapter two, and uh, if you were uh, reading ahead or something, it could be uh, chapter three. But uh, I wouldn't say that's a that's a must. That's where we'll kind of continue on. Uh, today we'll just get into a little bit more of the introduction of the model. All right, so this is kind of the mental model, and I have. That's right. Well, that, that's where we'll start off on uh, when we come back. But um, do you guys see that all right? It looks small for me, but you guys have good young eyes. So uh, there's a lot of things going on here. So we're going to kind of unpack uh, what this thing is on tackling problems. Um, so we've got clarification, transformation, implementation, and then we've got these little uh, triangles in the side. And so we're going to use this as kind of a mental model to work through towards a solution to given to given problems. All right, so the authors have identified three stages to the creative process. So clarification, transformation, implementation of a problem. So think about when you first start confronting, maybe I should go to the United States for uh, school. Um, and so what are the things that we want to do? We know that, wow, that's like a life changing type of thing, right? I'm going to be leaving family. You know, there's so many issues. Oh, I just don't know. I don't know what, what's going to happen or how I'm going to do, if, if things are going to work out or not. So uh, for something like that, we want to first start to analyze the, the data. And then what this is saying is that when we need to be creative about something, Let's first have some clarification of what does it mean to be to move to Ottawa, Kansas, right? And so start to clarify all of the things that are related to uh, the issue. Um, transformation of taking the things that we clarified and transforming them into more of a plan of actually getting the details. Like um, we might get down to the details of how am I getting there? Um, I'm going to do an airplane. Where, where am I going to get the tickets? And who's going to pick me up from the airport, right? So we might start to transform some of those details into a plan. And then furthermore, it might get more complicated with uh, how we implement that plan. So when we are going to do it, uh, are there going to be unknowns of other people that I need to meet in the meantime or something else, right? So that's kind of the process. So we're almost going in slow motion, but if we pace ourselves and approach the problem uh, in that fashion, then we can have better solutions as the whole and, and more creative benefit and, and benefits to the overall process. All right, so that's kind of on the outside of the circle. So the very first step then is gathering data. Assessing the situation is in the middle here. So before we start clarifying what we have, we need to get our hands on information. So assessing is to describe and identify relevant data to determine the next process in the step. So let's, let's kind of push Ricardo's thing here, because I think that's, a, that's an interesting one. So you guys can all imagine, uh, now you can pretend you're, well, I, where are you from again? Was it Columbia? Columbia. So imagine you're going to go to Columbia, right? If you're here in the States, um, what are some relevant data to determine the next step? What are some things you want to start gathering information on for our trip to or from Columbia? So what is data? Because we usually are talking computers, but we're not talking computers now with this. Information about it. Yeah, Bobby? Uh, like weather. Yeah, that'd be a great one. So, weather. Do I have to have a heavy coat or are you in Bogota? Yeah. Okay, so a pretty good climate. You guys get 
some cold, but you don't get snow there, right? I don't think you got any snow. You have to go down like to Peru or further down. Okay. Um, okay, so weather might be important. How? What kind of clothes are we going to pack? Good. What else, Bryce? Language barriers. Language. Okay. Yeah. Do do uh, American do eighty percent of Americans speak Spanish? No. Do sixty percent of Americans speak Spanish? No. Do thirty percent of Americans speak Spanish fluently? No. So that would be a good thing to know coming from a Spanish-speaking uh, country, right? Uh, like how many people? So I've done that when I've traveled to other countries. Uh, that's what the nice thing about visiting India is um, a, a large majority of Indians speak English. Uh, especially the younger ones, but you get the, the older crowd, but most of them are being taught English as a second language right away through all of their schooling in India. So you can actually, you know, have a conversation with especially younger generation in, in India. Um, it makes it a lot easier to travel there. Okay, good. What else? Culture. What's that? Culture. 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 Okay. Good one. So yeah, do we... Uh, do we hug as a greeting? Do we kiss on the cheek? Do we handshake? Uh, I don't know why that was the first thing that came to mind. Like when you, because you're going to be meeting new people, right? What's the customs there? What's the culture like? Um, in terms of eating, and maybe as we're as we're eating, is there proper etiquette of uh, what you do while you eat? All these little things that we take for granted uh, in our native country now, all of a sudden, might be a little bit different. Good. Other things? Yeah, Cameron, where are you from again? England. England, okay. So yeah, you've got less of a language barrier, but still there's customs and culture and other things. I'm sorry, what? Time. Time, what do you mean? Uh, time zones. Time zone, okay. Time zone, so that could be a factor, yeah. Coming from England, what do you got, about a seven hour difference? Uh, six hours. Six hours, depending on where you're at. Yeah. Columbia, one? One hour. Yeah. One hour. So it makes it a little easier. Well, how am I going to have conversations with my family back home with one hour time difference? Not too big a deal. I can pick up the phone and it's one hour off. I pick up the phone at uh, uh, 10, 8, 10 p.m. to call my folks and they might not be too happy getting woke up at 3 a.m. in the morning from home. What's wrong? What's wrong? Okay. Uh, I saw another hand up. Bryce? What? Laws. Laws. Yeah. Yeah. You go to. Um, Certain countries, uh, this kind of ties in a little bit to culture, um, especially with laws. Um, but some of the laws, I guess, if you go to, I was thinking of head coverings. Uh, if you go to a Middle Eastern country or something, it might be the law in terms of head coverings for females. In India, it'd be more of a cultural thing to possibly at different times, like for a church service. You don't necessarily cover up, but you might put a, a head covering on as kind of a custom. If you didn't do it, you're not going to get you know, uh, ostracized or killed, especially being a, a tourist, you know, you, you're free to make mistakes. But in other countries, it could be jail time or something if you maybe broke the law. And maybe that's a bad example of head coverings, but it could be something like that. Okay, other things coming back? We can get a little more specific even if we're, if we're thinking about Ricardo's journey to Ottawa or if we're thinking about us journey, journeying to Colombia for something. Cameron? Money. Money. Okay. Well, and what are you thinking about in terms of money? Like currency. About what? Oh, currency. Currency exchange. I was thinking even more. I think you could add a few more things on money because um, we're thinking about uh, Ricardo coming here not for a, a just a two-week trip or something where you might be involved with money, but we're talking about living here for an extended period of time. So what other money comes into mind? Yeah, cost of living and adjustments that you need. So, um, you know, timing of eating. So how are we going to uh, pay for stay? Um, and that could be um, monthly income coming in. I don't know if there's loans or otherwise, but basically kind of budgeting, overall budgeting of the trip. Okay, good. Other things. Yeah. The schools being different. The schools being different. So just knowing stuff. Uh, education. I guess you so education or OU details, right? OU details. We 
which might be related a little bit to time. When I was thinking time, you also have time, budgeting of time of, do I need to be somewhere at some point for my sport or for the classes or learning that sort of thing uh, might, be, might be different. Okay, so that's probably a good, a good start. The list is actually a lot longer and probably more detailed. But one of the things that we'll learn when we get to this chapter a little bit is you can do the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So now, how do we do over here? Did we put very much who? What who might be relevant that we didn't even think of as we were doing this short little exercise? Could be. I'm thinking a little more individually, perhaps, but it could be that. Again, when we when we actually do this exercise later, it could be a lot of things, and that's the whole point. Um, who you're staying with. Who you're staying with, yeah. That might be, you know, who's your coach? Who's the president? Who's my academic content, right? So you can start naming off a number of names to this list of people that are important before you come on the trip, like, at least these people I should have talked to or emailed or texted, you know, whatever, had some sort of communications with, right? Who's on the who list? Uh, what? What are we doing? Where is it at? So education was a little bit on the what side, right? When? We talked about time zone, but uh, when is this happening? What's the timing of the trip? When do I arrive? You know, kind of having a calendar. Who, what, when, where? Uh, where? Uh, we talked a little bit about the culture, and that might fall into some of those items. Why? Uh, why is this uh, happening? Why is it a good idea? Uh, you might start coming up with some other ideas related to the uh, getting information about why this is important. Like, what? Why? Why am I actually doing this? So, what's my objective? Maybe uh, so that you start to think about things that are off of your objective rather than staying to what you had in mind. And then how would be maybe the flight and other stuff. So that is data. So when we see data and we're assessing the situation that we're doing, we're kind of running through all these details. We're not, the, the key thing we're not trying to do is make connections at this point. We're actually just stockpiling a whole bunch of information. You can see that if we start to say, uh, let's pick on currency, like, oh, well, what, what actually is the exchange rate again? Now, let's go back and, and all of a sudden you start going down a rabbit hole and you're starting to think about, oh, yeah, and then I'm going to need money to do this. Oh, but before I do that, I got to talk to the dean of, of academic affairs. And, oh, that means I got to get my schedule done. You see how you kind of run down that rabbit hole of you're already trying to do the process? So you kind of have to be disciplined to think about, um, what your task at hand is, and that's just gathering the data. Because that's what part of this is going to help us do. The part that I was just doing is going to be some of this next steps. All right, questions or comments there? All right, so you can kind of move wherever you want to, depending on what your problem is at hand. It doesn't have to be in the order of this. It might be that you've already clarified all of the details. You have a really good handle of the details, and now you really need to start to put a plan together. Or you might have already done some of that, and now it's all focused on implementation. So we don't have to go in order of the way these things are. It just seems to be uh, the, better, the better way to go. For most circumstances, if you're going the whole process, that would be the natural way to do it. All right. So we are going to be training our brains to go through this process each time with each one of these steps. And we kind of started doing it a little bit already. So for approaching a problem, we're going to use divergent thinking. So Here's what we started with. 
And a lot of times people stop short. So divergent thinking, I kind of kept pushing you guys a little bit, but then I was just trying to highlight the point. But you'll kind of stop short with the area of familiarity. Like, oh yeah, these are the first things that came to mind. Like, oh, well, it's an international trip. We got culture, we got time zone, we got currency, right? And so you kind of keep going there. And what we want to do is train ourselves to diverge even more. So to not toss out things too early. So we're going to use what we call divergent thinking to diverge our brains and get lots of things on the table. Then we don't want to stop short because we might not come to as many solutions. Now we're going to use convergent thinking to come to our solutions. So we're going to kind of get that rhythm of diverging and then converging. And that's what we're going to do through all of the steps. So you've got these little diamonds as a reminder that when we are starting to clarify, we're going to explore ideas and then we're going to converge on some of those ideas. We're going to formulate some strategies. We're going to diverge, converge, diverge, converge, diverge, converge with all of those steps. We're always kind of thinking that way. Okay, so pull out your papers. This is today's in class points. Spend a little time writing some of these basics down. So divergent thinking. Basically what I write on the board, you guys write on the board. Give me your notes and I'll return these back to you as well. Like the other ones. So divergent thinking is a broad search. A broad search for many diverse and novel alternatives. A broad search for many diverse and novel. What was that word novel? We did that last time. Novel. What's that? Unique. unique. Good. So unique alternatives. So a search for diverse. And what do we mean by diverse, I guess? In this context, diverse alternatives. So we're all big on diversity. What does that mean? Bobby? Different. Different? So we don't want things that are too related, like we focused up too much on the on the winds or something, right? So hitting things in a number of different angles, bringing some diversity to um, our options is what we're doing in this in this phase. So how do we do that? So here are the skills um, that we need. We need one fluency. Fluency. Get a large number of ideas. Get a large number of ideas or responses. <clears throat> so we want numbers. Um, how many of you have done some sort of brainstorming activity? Some sort of brainstorming activity. What's some other? What's a rule of brainstorming that you remember? And you might not have had it ever. We're going to do a formal, kind of formalized brainstorming in this class later on. But anybody remember something? If you're trying to brainstorm something, what's one of the things? Um, you did, let's say there's a group of five people. It's like, let's brainstorm an idea. What's one of the rules that you should follow when you're brainstorming? Should we, somebody says something, do we say, oh, that's dumb. We're not going to go with that. That's what it is. The listening. Basically, you don't shut anybody down. Any idea is an idea, even if it seems far-fetched. Right? 
and you don't agree with it, or oh, uh, you always say stupid stuff, and, or whatever, right? So then that just shuts down. So basically, all things are on the table. Why? Because we want a large number of ideas, even the dumb ones, quote unquote, dumb ones. And we'll, we'll kind of explore that later. So we want, during this step, we want a large number of ideas. Now, when we get to the converging stage, we might toss them out because they weren't a good fit for whatever reason, or maybe we'll modify them. So fluency is just getting a large number of ideas on the table. Number two, second skill to building diverse and novel alternatives is flexibility. Flexibility. Flexibility means getting a variety, getting variety in kinds uh, or categories, in kinds or categories of ideas or responses. So being flexible in terms of, well, those two things, you're way off topic. Who cares? Put it down. That's part of the flexibility skill. It's just taking it in. Number three, I think I'll write up here. Number three, elaboration. Elaboration. That is the skill of adding to or developing developing existing ideas or responses. So now you can kind of think of this as a mod to something else somebody said, right? So you said this and you're like, oh, I have no clue what you're talking about with that. But now that you mention it, if, if we did it like this with feathers instead of fluff and added marshmallows instead of twinkles, then I think that could work. So now you have what the other person said and you've got one with fluff and twinkles to it. I totally made that up. I don't know where that's coming from. Maybe I'm hungry or something. But you see what we're doing is we're taking an existing idea and then modifying it. So that's another way to get more and more ideas. It could be something as similar as we said culture. Well, then that could go a million different directions, right? So we start by adding culture, but then we can add other things that are maybe related to culture or that spark an idea. So fluency, flexibility, elaboration, and then number four is originality. Originality is the skill of getting new, novel, or, or different ideas. Or responses. Okay, so during our divergent phase of thinking, if you want to go ahead and just circle fluency, flexibility, elaboration, and originality are all very much encouraged during this phase of thinking. Those are the things we want to work on and build on. Okay, so I'm 
I'm going to play a little video. That is an old video from Steve Jobs. We talked about him. Who's Steve Jobs again? The leader of Apple. The leader of Apple. Is he alive or dead? Dead meat or alive? Dead meat. Dead meat. That's so cool. Um, so yes, he went through kind of uh, different times. Did you guys watch the uh, the Apple movie that basically, there's been a couple of them now, I think, but um, what was your, did anybody watch the movie on his, kind of documentary on his life and stuff? Nobody? Okay, oh, that's pretty good. How many of you are iPhone users? What? Everybody? Everybody's an iPhone. Wow. Yeah, it has been, and it was out at the movie theater. This was quite a while ago, too. But. So he's kind of an a hole, um, is the way a lot of people would have described him. And so I like this video clip because it just uh, gives you an idea of things that were going on at his company. And since you're all uh, part of his company, this is a, it's just a news feed. This is from, and I'm gonna play this a little quickly. We don't need to listen to, we'll do one, two, five. Um, I'll, I'm gonna skip through part of it, but it's done in 2007. When did the first iPhone come out? Anyway, now around 2007. Okay, so we're going back in time, and it's kind of interesting to see him talk about what he did um, with with the product and some of the things that he was uh, working on. So I'm going to try to find the interview. I, I think we'll just play this. So this will be fine. Uh, so he had a scandal where there was like some charges of uh, almost like inside the trading. So that's part of what they're talking about. You can kind of ignore that part. But they're looking at the Apple stock 13 years ago, 14 years ago. I'm on 1.25. Is that too fast, folks? I said I was bumping it up, so that's a, are you guys okay with that? Okay. I think you'll, once you get shot like that. The industry is much the same way that Macintosh did in 1984 and then iPod in 2001. Now it's iPhone's turn. This is an extremely important product for Apple's future. Something I asked Steve Jobs about in this first CNBC interview. First of all, you look at the handsets. This is probably not only the most vibrant technology sector there is out in the globe, this is also one of the most competitive. Why in the world would Apple Computer want to jump into the handset market with so much competition and already so many players? You know, uh, one of the, the, the biggest uh, motivations for, for working so hard for a few years to make a great product is you want one yourself. And uh, we use all the handsets out there. And uh, boy, is it frustrating. It's really frustrating. It's a category that, that needs to be reinvented needs to be made more, not only more powerful, but much easier to use. And uh, so we can contribute something. And we don't mind the fact that there's other good companies making products out there. Uh, the fact is that there's, there's a, a billion handsets that uh, were sold in 2006. And so we just got 1% market share, that's 10 million units. And we think what we've done is to, is to reinvent the phone and uh, it completely change what your expectations are going to be uh, for what you can carry in your pocket. You mentioned in your uh, keynote, you talked about the Mac, you talked about the iPod, and now there's this. What makes this such a product that would enjoy such a lofty company? How important is this to Apple Computer and Woman? You know, time will tell. Uh, the Mac changed the whole computer industry, and it really made computers easy to use for the first time, and brought graphics into the personal computer for the first time. Uh, the iPod uh, changed the way we listen to music and changed the whole music industry. Uh, I think the iPhone may really uh, change the whole phone industry. And, and I think uh, give us something that, that's, that's vastly more powerful in terms of you know, making phone calls and keeping all your contacts on it, having the best iPod we've ever made fully integrated into it, and having the internet in your pocket with a real browser and real email and real, you know, the best implementation of Google Maps on the planet. Having all this stuff in your pocket and yet having it be 10 times easier to use. I think this is where the world's going. 
you mentioned earlier in the speech as well, you kept coming back to it too. You kept showing the competitors, you kept showing Paul and William and Nokia and Motorola. What message are you sending not only to your immediate competitors, but to the entire industry? We're a financial network, obviously, so from an investor standpoint, I don't know if you can see what your comments have been doing today, but you know, research and motion is getting clobbered. And I would imagine the other smartphone manufacturers are also feeling an enormous amount of pressure because you can now officially enter the game. Well, you know, we don't really think of those terms more product company. We, we love great products. And so, you know, in order to, to explain what our product is, we have to contrast it to what's out there right now and what people use. Uh, so, you know, that's what we do. And looking at this also, when you and I talked about the video iPod and that fund, I'm sorry, the iPod that also does video, and I'm careful to correct that last time. Um, you said you, you, you never manufactured so many of these things before, and we'll see how it goes. You know, video is going to be a killer app, but we'll see what happens. Yes. Um, what's your underplaying statement today about downplaying the uh, potential opportunity for this device? Well, to go back to our prior conversation, uh, we can now say that video worked. It is a killer app. We sold over 50 million TV show episodes. And in four months, we sold 1.3 million feature films off iTunes. So it's definitely working. Uh, as far as this goes, you know, this is the future, and, and it's not. You know, it's. I wish. Uh, I wish we could uh, sell it for 100 dollars today. We can't. It's a little more expensive than that. But uh, as we bring the cost down uh, year over year and can appeal to more and more people. I don't see what everybody would want with this. Last question for you. Again, I mentioned we are a financial network, and we know the question is coming because you read the, the press just as much as I do about you and your stature here at, uh, at Apple Computer. There is this ongoing stock options backdating and controversy that you're dealing with. What message do you have for shareholders and investors and consumers and employees that this particular controversy is what's going to happen in terms of your tenure at the company and how it's going to affect you? And how do you reassure people that this is not going to take you? Well, you know, it, it's, it's a little frustrating sometimes with the press is writing and a lot of these folks just have no I think what's good about this is uh, highlighting him as a leader with this issue that he did. So listen to what he says about kind of how he handled the heat that he's getting and kind of translating that into the, into the company. So he already got kind of the rah-rah, was he right about we all want these things apparently, <laughs> right? So it's like, oh, he, he, he really did make some, some good stuff. So here's this part. Idea what they're talking about. I mean, it is frustrating to read it. But, you know, we did our own internal investigation, and then we actually got an independent investigator, a former federal prosecutor who's extremely high in regard. And they looked at, Jesus, the better part of a million documents, and it took several months. And, and uh, uh, they came out with their report that, that uh, said what it said. And one of the things it said was that no current management had, uh, had any misconduct. We did find some things that, we, that I wish we hadn't found, and I, you know, I, I, as CEO, uh, you know, to some extent, I'm responsible for it. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we turned that all over to the SEC, and, and now uh, they'll take a look at, at, uh, at some of those things that we found. But I, you know, I don't think they're going to affect current management, and I think it's going to be just fine. Steve Jobs here said, uh, well, I, I, I serve the pleasure of the board of shareholders, and as long as they want me, I, I'd love to keep you in this job. Yeah, I think they might. So thanks very much. Okay, good. Uh, Candidate and comfortable Steve Jobs, no question about it. Asking the yeah, he got fired, by the way. Yeah, he got fired, by the way. Yeah, I can't remember the timing, but it was definitely after this. So, ultimately, Steve Jobs built the company, you know, he's kind of the lead guy, and uh, they thought he was getting too uh, wacky, so they fired him. So, Steve Jobs lost his job as the head of the company. So, when he said, I serve at the pleasure of the board of directors and stuff. Well, that's true. Even the founder of the business could be let go. That's part of what, what can happen when you uh, allow your company to go public is that it's, it's, you lose some of that control that you had when you started it in your garage with Steve Wozniak. Just a quick cool question. Like, <clears throat> you're the top guy. Who has the authority The board of directors. So in a corporate setting, you've got the, um, so the CEO is the top guy, president, you know, slash president, you can think of it this way. And then you've got all your vice presidents, and then you got, you know, people that report to them, and then you get people that are working on the back of them, right? It's kind of the normal uh, corporate structure tree. But yeah, what a lot of people don't know is, though, so when you're a publicly traded company, you have the board of directors. And these are the people that are actually the shareholders. So these are usually primary shareholders. So they are the owners of the company. And the president CEO is hired by them. So that's ultimately who this person has to answer to is the board. And same thing with Kevin Eichner here at the university. Uh, so he's kind of our top dog. He's got the chancellor position right now. 
but he answers to Ottawa University's board of directors. So he has to report to them, and if he wants to make some major moves, he has to sell them on it. Like I think we're uh, we're going to have a new athletic facility here on campus, and then opening up the Arizona campus and stuff like that. Those are all board-approved decisions, so that he doesn't have like lock, stock, and barrel. And and so one more thing. So when you are mom and pop operating out of your garage, you are the board of directors, right? You're the owner, you're the president slash owner. And so when you go public, you're no longer the only owner anyway. You've got a bunch of other owners. Like Elon Musk is still, he's 20% of Tesla. So even Elon Musk can't do whatever the hell he wants with his billions uh, under Tesla. Because then it comes to a vote, and each share is a vote. So 80% of Tesla is owned by other people. 20% is Elon Musk. Now, pretty much, if Elon Musk is still kind of a leader like Steve Jobs was, if he wants to do some things or whatever, he could probably get it done. But he has to get this through a voting process with the board. OK, Bryce. Is Steve Jobs a primary shareholder in Apple? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's still, I don't know what it is, ownership level waffle between i was kind of surprised i didn't know elon musk was as low as 20 percent but uh, uh facebook i think zuckerberg is still at one point he was still half owner he might have diluted some of his ownership uh again too but all of these spaces that we see jeff bezos with amazon um they'll either maintain some of their shares or they're free to sell some of their shares so um if they want to go buy an island in the Caribbean or something, and you own 20% of Apple, you just sell 1% of Apple probably, and you can go buy an island in the Caribbean, so. So, like, say like, if he owns like 50% or more, couldn't they have still fired him through the board of directors if he owns half of it? Or uh, yeah, possibly not. So that gets into what their, um, each cor set of corporate documents could have a different level of how many, votes it takes to get rid of somebody, maybe it's two thirds of the vote instead of 50-50. So uh, maybe uh, Steve Jobs had 51% of the company, but in order to get people to buy his company, he allowed it to be uh, a lower percentage to pass them. So that just depends on the corporate documents. All right, anything else there? Okay, so let's play this thing. Trying to make sure that Chloe of the Chloe of the Fox Cardinals are stock options back in HQ. Maria Jackson. Jim, thanks very much. We continue our discussion now on Steve Jobs and uh, Adam Computer. Joining me now with your insight is Richard Stice, he's hardware equity analyst at Stanford Forest. Lynn Turner, managing director of research at Glass Lewis. Gentlemen, nice to have you with us. Thanks, Welcome to the program. Give me a quick reaction uh, to the iPhone and the impact on the stock uh, in 07. Sure. Well, in terms of uh, the, the iPhone release, I think you look at it. Uh, the market was at very, very high for this, and even exceeded our expectations. It looks like it's really a really revolutionary product. Um, the, it's now a touchscreen format, the buttons are not, it's a very large screen, uh, a lot of new technology and capabilities related to it. And in terms of what we're projecting, once it actually does come to market uh, in June and in the subsequent 12 month period, we think we can add about 25 cents a share uh, on a trade basis. And that's assuming about 50% rate of capitalization with the standalone iPhone device. Now, if they're able to get to a little bit better than that, to about 15 million units, we think with the additional leverage that they have, you can add maybe 70 to 75 cents to the bottom line. So we, we think it's uh, definitely a homeowner product for Apple. Lynn, do you agree? Uh, yeah, I don't think the stock option scandal is going to impact this. At the end of the day, uh, uh, earnings are going to be there. If Jobs is able to put out a, a better mousetrap when it comes to the cell phone, uh, heck, all of us would probably like to have a better cell phone than what we have today. And if he's able to accomplish that, uh, I think this company will continue to do very well. What about the issue that is present in the market today, which is the fact that prices keep coming down. This is basically a commodity, right? The cell phone, everybody's competing for the same customer. How does that play into things? Sure, well, I'll jump on that. And, and if you look at what they did related to the, their maps, uh, actually, in FY06, they actually saw ASP's rise modestly. So Apple has a certain, obviously, a coolest factor to the cash in it. They have a lot of people that will follow and, and purchase the product just because it is an Apple. They've had good experiences in the past. Even with the iPod, even the Mac, or uh, another particular product that we can use to iTunes. So you're right, it's a commodity really in space, and certain prices will grow over time. But we think Apple is, is going to be able to, to forestall that to some extent. Real quick on the stock performance today, an all time high. The uh, shares certainly got a huge boost from this. Did the market get it right, Len? Uh, yeah, I think they, they did. I think there's tremendous cachet for Apple amongst the, uh, the teens and the 20 to 30 year olds in this country. He's got tremendous pull. He's got tremendous market recognition. Mm -hmm. And he again puts out the better mass trap. Uh, people are going to follow him. All right. We'll leave it there, gentlemen. That's that. Thanks very much. Thanks for it. We'll talk to you soon. And upcoming clinical trial could make. Uh, 
Okay. So that gives us a little Steve Jobs. Any other further questions there? So now we converge. So on the conversion side, we're going to take all of these ideas that we had and try to figure out what's relevant for our problem at hand. So So convergent thinking is a focused and affirmative, a focused and affirmative evaluation. evaluation of all alternatives. So we brainstormed a bunch of ideas about maybe solutions for something. And so now we're going to kind of funnel those down. Some of them might have been quote unquote dumb ideas or something else. So we're going to kind of narrow things down. What does it mean to affirm something? How does affirmative strike you? Confirm. So it is, it's kind of similar to it, but a little different if you are affirming something instead of confirming it. Agreeing. Okay, it is a little closer to agreeing. It's a little closer to agreeing. It's like going to someone else. Like, I confirm that someone else has to. Yeah, they're back to confirm. And it is close. They're, they're close. So affirming something is, is um, it's got a more positive to it. So kind of a positive uh, connotation to it. So instead of um, when, when you are affirming something, you're supporting it might be another good word to throw in there. So it's kind of being supportive and kind of agreeing, but it's not your decision of yes, no, perhaps. So imagine you're in a, uh, a group of five people trying to come up with some ideas. Maybe it's not your call as to say yes or no, right? That would be more of a confirmation of a, of a maybe your vote or something. Or rather, we're just affirmatively looking at the ideas um, of the alternatives. And then we're staying focused on, on, on the element that we're doing. So how do we do some of this convergent thinking here the skills skills list of what we're doing for this. Number one is we are developing the ideas we had before. So developing, strengthening, strengthening, improving, strengthening, improving, fleshing out, Fleshing out the overall option so that it appears to go. So maybe our uh, problem at hand is coming up with a, a new mascot for the Braves. All right, so maybe that's our problem, a new mascot for the Braves. And so we've, we've done our divergent thinking, and some people had lizards, and of course we didn't want to say that was a dumb idea, but they had a lizard and a wolf, and actually they kind of went through this exercise with uh, um, down in Arizona. Uh, when they, did they have a different mascot? Did you guys know that? 
so they are the wolves. Uh, I can't remember if it's a timber wolf or if it's just a wolf, but something, a gray wolf, I think, uh, is their thing, mascot. And so we had ideas of the suns and the Neptunes, and you know, you can imagine when we went through our divergent thinking with a diverse group of people, we had uh, 40 ideas of different mascots. And maybe um, we got into details of, of colors or something. So once we get to there, we're going to be taking those ideas and developing them further. So some of them might kind of rise to the top. And so we're going to try to strengthen that idea, improve it, flesh out the overall option. So it's like, well, maybe we don't want to be um, the lizards, uh, but the squirrels, there's a lot of squirrels around here. And so we're trying to think, well, I don't want to do lizards because uh, we don't have much, it's in, it's in the middle of Kansas and we don't have a lot of lizards around or something. I don't know. So we're, we didn't shoot, we didn't say that when Jake came up with the idea, Jake says, how about the lizards? At the time when we were doing the divergent thinking, we didn't say, Jake, that's stupid. We don't have any freaking lizards in Kansas. I don't know what you're even thinking, right? We just said, oh, lizards, got it, right? So now when we're doing this part, we're going to still not say, Jake, that was a stupid idea, by the way, because that would not be affirmative. But we might say, you know, a lizard's kind of like a squirrel, and maybe we don't want to be the chipmunks or something, but, uh, you know, four legs and a longer tail, somehow we're like, yeah, that made me think. So instead of being in shutdown mode, I was kind of in this idea of affirming ideas and developing them into more. Okay, does that kind of make sense for now? We're going to, we'll end up reviewing this stuff later too, but that's the idea of this convergent thinking. Uh, number two, we're going to start prioritizing. So prioritizing, prioritizing. So this would be determining, determining the rank order, the rank order among options. Determining the rank order among options. So at this point, we might not be throwing out the lizards even, uh, but the lizards might go down to the bottom, right? So all of a sudden, we're starting to think, oh, how about an otter? How about a a uh, squirrel, how about a buffalo or something? And so we start actually prioritizing, like, oh yeah, everybody seems to be thinking that's kind of a cool idea and that kind of matches this. And so the lizards down here and the buffalo and the otter and stuff are up here for whatever reason, right? So we're allowing ourselves to start prioritizing, but not necessarily throwing out um, the other options at this point, but prioritizing. Number three, screening. So screening, you can think of as filtering. And now we might be throwing out the lizards. Keeping uh, some and discarding others. For particular reasons. So now the lizard might bite the dust because of reasons X, Y, and Z. We might just say, yeah, you know, let's just let this one go. We've got 45 other choices. We can start to do some, some screen. Number four, sorting. So sorting is categorizing or grouping. Categorizing or grouping. by some implicit 
or explicit scheme. So we got the buffalo, we got the otto, the otter, we've got the squirrel. Those are all mammals or, of some sort. And then we've got the sharks and the mahi mahi and the octopuses. And right? so they're kind of in this uh, something that lives in the ocean category. And then we've got the suns and the Neptunes and the Mercuries or something, right? And so they're kind of non-animals. So we might, as part of this process, it might be helpful to do some sorting as we start to figure out um, the direction that we want to head and creating some categories. All right, and then lastly for this one is supporting. And this kind of fills in with the affirmative thing. So supporting is examining for positive attributes. Examining for positive attributes. Identifying identifying and putting them forward. To be considered later, considered further. So supporting and, sorry, I got a little low on you here. You can feel free to stand up if you can't read that, but I'll write it out again. Examining for positive attributes and identifying and putting them forward to be considered further. So, uh, Jake, the lizard thing was, you know, kind of interesting. I don't think it really works here, but at the same time, lizards come out when it's warm, right? And uh, otherwise, they're, they're there. I like that they uh, are very attentive. Lizards' eyes, like they barely blink, right? They're always looking around. So attentiveness might be an attribute of the lizard one that we want to kind of focus on. Like, that would be a good idea for, that would be an attribute. Now I see, Jake, where you're coming up with a lizard idea that there's some things about a lizard that are kind of cool, the, the whole sun and bright sun and feeling warm and, and uh, the blinking. So let, let's kind of hang on to that as we evaluate the squirrel and the buffalo and the shark and the octopus, right? Maybe there's something there that helps us filter down other ideas, right? Okay, like your scenario when you're talking about like it's a dumb idea but we don't understand it. It kind of seems like it's just like blowing smoke up your butt and like wasting a bunch of time going <laughs> through this. So yeah. It's like actually figuring it out. So like what is really the advantage of it? So the advantage of it is we are going to be in creativity mode. And so creativity mode might mean that uh, when Jake said a lizard, I thought sunshine. And so as we're working together as a team to come to a solution, I don't want to throw out the lizard, even if I do kind of think, oh, like, where are they going with that? It might spark something in your particular brain of sun. Oh, rays of sun sign warming up a rock. That might be a good fit for us. Let's kind of focus on sun. And then sunshine brings us to the ocean. Like, I, I did lots of sunshine when I went down on my Cancun, Mexico trip. It was great. And then you start thinking of the ocean, and then we're to the dolphins or the sharks. And, oh, maybe the sharks would be a good mascot. So we went from lizard to sun to Cancun to sharks. And Jake's dumb, quote, unquote, lizard comment was an important piece of getting us to the shark. You know what I mean? So it's going to be part of the creative process is allowing lots of ideas and everybody thinking openly. Um, if we go back to the divergent, your divergent skills list, we're again like adding on to the to the lizard or something else and modifying it so that it's another line item. So all of that's going to be part of the creative process. Um, 
I might also add that as a as a facilitator to creative exercises like that, you'll kind of know when to you know start to steer things a different direction or it's time to stop thinking about the divergent phase. Like when do we stop diverging and when do we start converging? So that's that's part of the skill with uh, the process too. Okay, anybody else there? All right, so again, supporting, or I'm sorry, developing, circle these, prioritizing, screening, sorting, and supporting is all part of the convergent phase. All right, so. Let's walk through the rest of this and get ready for spring break. Okay, so here's what you guys just wrote on your sheets that we'll read and get back to you too. So here's the whole model again with those triangles. And so with each phase, we're going to start with clarification. Again, you can start in every other one, but usually when you're trying to come up with a problem, we want to explore the vision um, of, of uh, what we're trying to accomplish. So this is kind of big thinking about vision of, you know, does it fit if we're thinking about Ottawa University maybe and uh, where are we going to be? We're doing some long-term planning. You know, what do we want Ottawa University to look like 10 years from now? Um, Steve Jobs in that video. What are some of the things as he unrolls the iPhone, he's kind of basking in the glory of it being a pretty good success here in 2007 and early sales and whatnot. That was even, I think, a little bit before they knew how big it was going to exactly be. But what are some things that he needs to think about over the next five years? Yeah. Improvement of his product. Improvement of his product. Why? It's already great. It's the best there is. More technology advances to make it even better. What else might be going right around the corner? Okay, yeah, that could be there, right? Taking on um, uh, criticisms, trying to make it be better or whatever, the benefits. Competitive, that's what I was looking for. Samsung Galaxy right around the corner, right? We can kind of start to, oh, well, that's not that hard to develop something that does that. So. This is all a process. So once you kind of come to a solution and you implement it, now Steve Jobs might need to come back and start doing what's the next problem. So well, how are we going to make the phone better? How are we going to uh, keep customers with us instead of running to a competitor? Whatever the case is. So exploring the vision, we're going to diverge and converge on getting a vision together. What sort of challenges will we face with exploring, trying to get to where we want to be? We want to identify where we want to go, but then what's going to be in our way? So that might be getting more specific about the competition in the market for the iPhone or Ottawa University. Uh, do we go on with online products? Do we open up another campus? Do we keep adding uh, sports? We've got women's play football now, I think was the most recent, I think, right? So do we keep going down that path and adding uh, new sports, or do we uh, head a different direction? So I'm just kind of working our way around the ring here. So we get exploring ideas. So for the transformation, now we have a vision of where we want to go and what sort of ideas can we have uh, to get to where we want to be. And then formulating solutions, again, we're divergently thinking about the solutions from these ideas and what we want to do to get there. And implementation, exploring acceptance, diverging on who's going to be a roadblock to us. Do I need to um, talk to some of these people first before I present it to the board, right? So when I actually go to implement generation four of the iPhone, um, who do I need on my court? What are some possible things in the implementation phase that could hang us up? Right? So we're going to divergently think about those type of issues and converge on a, on a solution. 
And then finally, formulating a plan, uh, getting the actual details of the plan. So all of that is the chapters of the book. We're not going to do this today. So each one of these ends up being part of your textbook. So let me show you the... So this is really just an introduction of where we're ultimately going. Okay, so... Chapter three um, is what we were just kind of working on, kind of setting up this model, convergent and divergent thinking, creative leadership at a glance, and then we're uh, doing transformation, developing a creative mindset. And then here, chat, starting with chapter six is working through most of the, what we just briefly walked you through, assessing the situation. Then we're gonna learn a bunch of tools on how we can better assess the situation. Chapter seven, exploring the vision, formulating challenges, exploring ideas. So we've got a whole, you know, 15 pages of stuff that we're gonna unpack, formulating solutions. Each one of them is going to come up with some exercises and things we can do to make this process easier. Exploring acceptance, formulating a plan. So that is kind of, a, again, an overview of the model and where we're going to start and where we're going to go. So ready to start spring break? Yeah. All right, mark your calendars. You're getting out early today. Look at that, 12.56.